Good afternoon. My name is Peter Sherris. I am the president of the Rotary Health Club of Oakland. Please, I want to welcome you to our regular 1230 meeting that we have on Thursdays. Our club has weathered two world wars, multiple recessions, a depression, a pandemic 100 years ago, and, uh, and I'm confident that we are going to weather this crisis as well. We have a tradition of recognizing our guests. Uh, and visiting Rotarians. And if you fall into that category, please go to uh, the chat section section of our uh, YouTube, uh, of our uh, 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 Zoom meeting, and uh, fill out letting us know your name and the place you come from. And we will recognize you a bit later in the session. We typically open our meetings with a recitation of our vision, which is that together, we see a world where people unite and take action to create lasting change across the globe, in our communities, and in ourselves. And then when we meet as a group, we all, we all say together in unison, Rotary connects us all. Another tradition we have is that we have a thought for the day, and today, Christine Watson is going to have our thought for the day. So Christine, let's get you unmuted and give us your thought for the day. Hi, Peter, President Peter. Hi, Christine. Can you hear me? We can. Okay. I have uh, six little stories with lots of meaning uh, in honor of May Day. Once all villagers decided to pray for rain. On the day of prayer, all the people gathered, but only one boy came with an umbrella. And that is faith. When you throw babies in the air, they laugh because they know you will catch them. That is trust. Every night we go to bed without any assurance of being alive the next morning, but we still set the alarms to wake up. That is hope. We plan big things for tomorrow in spite of zero knowledge of the future. That is confidence. We see the world suffering, but still we get married and have children. That is love. On an old man's shirt was written a sentence. I am not 80 years old. I am sweet and I'm, I'm sweet 16 with 64 years of experience and that is attitude. Have a happy day and live your life like these six stories. Remember good friends are the rare jewels of life, difficult to find and impossible to replace. There you go. Thank you, Christine. Faith, trust, hope, confidence, love, and attitude. Speaking of attitude, <laughs> <laughs> I have uh, invited uh, an old friend of mine uh, who happens to be His Excellency, the mayor of Port Costa, California, to uh, join us. Mitch, are you there? Let's get you unmuted, Mitch. I do see you. There we go. I'm going to unmute you right now. There you go. So, so how you doing, buddy? Ah, doing well. Honored to be part of this meeting and uh, be present with you guys. So I've known Mitch since he was 11 years old because I was his scoutmaster between then and when he was 18 years old. And Mitch and I have had some adventures together, haven't we? Yes. Would we you have. ever have believed that you would be mayor and I would be the president of the Rotary Club? No, but anything's possible, and we uh, <laughs> we, we, we 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 found that out at an er or me at an early age, anyways. All right. So Mitch, get ready. Mitch is a fantastic rockabilly, bluegrass, and country musician, and you've written a song called something, haven't you? Yes. Uh, in, in light of uh, in light of today's uh, current situation, I, I find that music is needed incredibly, and it bonds us as well as can be a, a great vehicle for delivering a message or messages of pertinent hope and. Uh, Facts as well as 
just uh, something to pick us all up and give us give us a lift and give us. All a right, lift. take it away. Housebound and down. Housebound and down, loaded up and quarantined. We're gonna ride this out the best we can. We got nowhere to go and a long time to get there. I'm housebound, got shelter in place at hand. Keep your spirits held up high, so never mind the blues. And don't go overdosing all the news. Cause there's COVID in California and in the world around you. We'll make it through, cause that's what we will choose. Housebound and down, loaded up and quarantined. We're gonna ride this out the best we can. We've got nowhere to go, and a long time to get there. I'm housebound, got shelter in place at hand. It's country above party, everybody does their part. Never mind, this could have been prevented from the start. Hoarding toilet paper and make some meals at home. You may be isolated, but you're not alone. House bound and down, loaded up and quarantined. We're gonna ride this out the best we can. We've got nowhere to go and a long time to sit here. I'm house bound, got shelter in place at hand. So look out for your neighbors. Remember to help your friends. If we work together, the faster this will end. A big thanks to all the doctors and the truckers too. There's so many folks who count on you. Housebound and down, loaded up and quarantined. We're gonna ride this out the best we can. We've got nowhere to go, and in a short time to get there. I'm housebound, got shelter in place at hand. Well, I'm housebound, I got shelter in place at hand. Hey, Mitch. All right. So, so Mitch, I just want you to know that I go to your uh, Facebook page and watch uh, the live from Polzac Ponderosa every Friday. And Thank for you for doing hours, I have a big smile on my face because I just love your music. I love your optimism and all of those homespun observations. So keep up the good work. And we'll see you Friday night on Facebook Live, Mitch Polzac. Thanks, Peter. And it was a pleasure to share this song with you guys today. All right. Take care. Thanks a lot, Mitch. Thank you. So we have another celebration that's uh, kind of happy today. Let's get Mia Bonta uh, uh, unmuted. There, there we go. Hi, Mia. Hi, how are you? <laughs> so Mia Bonta is the executive director of the Oakland Promise, and Mia is going to be inducted into the Rotary Club of Oakland today. We are so happy to have you. I'm so excited to be joining the Rotary. This is a great moment for me. So we typically give two interesting facts about our inductees. And so I'm only going to give one, and that is that between the age of zero and 16, you moved 13 times. And I have a feeling that gives you a tremendous knowledge about the students that you at Oakland Promise and we here at Cerrone Lena uh, gives you an insight into them. Yes, that is true. I, um, uh, I was raised by a single mother in New York City and um, for a cause of just needing to make sure that we could have affordable housing and safe housing, we often had to move often, but it didn't stop me from having an amazing educational experience. All right. Well, we have worked with you uh, also in your previous job uh, as part of Kinder Prep. So, Mia, we are very happy that you have chosen to join us. And please know that your family and friends are always welcome to join us for lunch when we get back together and to participate in all of our projects and events. By accepting membership, you have adopted our vision, which is that together we see a world where people unite and take action 
to create lasting change across the globe in our communities and in ourselves. And Mia, I look forward to presenting you with your rotary pin when we restart our meetings and we hope that you will wear it with pride and find pleasure and fulfillment by attending meetings, participating in our service activities and contributing to the, Oak, to the Rotary Foundation and the Oakland Rotary Endowment. It is my distinct pleasure and honor to induct you into the Rotary Club of Oakland. So we're all going to clap. This would this would be Mia, where you would get a standing ovation for. Uh, I know you get a lot of them, but I remember when I got my standing ovation. I don't get very many, so I love it. Uh, so welcome. Thank you for the dances and the claps and the recognition. <laughs> the honor to be a part of the Oakland the Oakland Rotary. All right, Mia. Thank you very much. All right, let's see who's next. I think it is. I've got confused on my schedule here. I think it's Jack Isles. Are you there, Jack? How are you? I, I'm good, Jack. Uh, we got some feedback on our trivial pursuits last time. What, 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 uh, what did we learn and what are we gonna do today? We're bringing it back by popular demand and we're gonna pull, uh, pull some trivia questions from the uh, Oakland Rotary uh, History book. Um, well, that's that's yeah. great, Jack. And what are what are members uh, competing for? They're competing for one of those beautiful hats you've got on. We've got them in uh, navy blue and khaki uh, tan. Fantastic. And how do they answer these trivia questions? You'll answer right in the chat box. So just go ahead, type in the answer as fast as you can. These are a little, uh, some of the Oakland Rotary history ones might be a little tough. So take your time and whoever gets it first is the winner. Fantastic. And these questions come from Linda Hamilton's book where we acknowledge 100 years of service in the city. Oh, it was a 100 year book. We've now been doing it for over 110 years. But so uh, what's the first question, Jack? Yeah, the first question, not too hard. Who is the founding member of clubs Oakland number no. three and San Francisco two? Ah, let's see. Da 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 da. So that's the first question. Let's go ahead and do the second question because these may be a bit tougher. The second question: What sea surrounds the Cayman Islands? What sea surrounds the Cayman Islands? So, as usual, we have two answers. Well. Oh my God, it's Tom Limon again is the winner of the Caribbean. But nobody's got the founding member of, uh, of Rotary Number no. 3 in San Francisco. We have two answers which are wrong. It was, it was Jack McAvoy. Even though it's the right kind of age, uh, we uh, will. So we're going to wait for those answers and go on to the, go on to the next uh, item here, which is Christine Watson. Hi, Christine. Let's get you unmuted. So Christine is doing a fantastic job of organizing our um, online auction and our raffle and our fund of need, which is replacing the uh, gala we couldn't have. So Christine, yes, it's your turn. Yes, President Peter, I'm here. Thank you. Okay, where am I? Okay. So you guys remember that last week I talked about any time during the meeting, we can all purchase um, Okay, I'll purchase a fine wine, fire pit and raffle tickets for $50 each. And you get a chance at over 25 bottles of fine wine and they're all included inside of a fire pit that hopefully you've got just a teeny little bit of backyard and you can put your fire pit out there and have a fabulous time drinking 25 bottles of wine with all of your close friends and you can even host your own wine tasting. So that's the first part of what I want to share with you guys. All right, what's the second part? 
Last week, I kind of hinted that we were going to have an online auction announcement for this week. So instead of the 2020 gala, we've moved all of our live auction items and our silent auction items online. So from your home, you'll be able to actually use the internet. And uh, starting on May 14th, you go on to this um, enclosed website and uh, you'll be able to take a look at all of the bidding uh, items. You'll be able to uh, see how your friends are doing. It's a two week process. It ends on May 30th. You can use any device that you might have at your home. Very cool, including your smartphone or your iPads or your iPhones. So whatever way you want to come on board, we need you to start bidding on May 14th for all of the items that are at our auction site. Also, I know that um, Pat's getting ready to remind me that we have a special request for anybody who needs assistance. If you're not comfortable being online and you need a buddy, we've got a great one. That's like a joke. <laughs> and then one more thing I want to share with you. Uh, we would like everybody to participate and we need a little extra help. If, does anybody have gift certificates just lying around the house that are still valid that you haven't been able to use for lots of reasons? So we'd like you to donate your gift certificates and we're gonna put them into a cool bundle and make them one of our uh, online auction items. So if you have one, just take a picture of it or scan a picture of it and email that to Pat so that we can uh, count on it in our bundles and then uh, mail it off to uh, Pat's mailing address and she's gonna give you instructions uh, online. So we're in, we're really excited about the uh, online auction instead of having our gala this time. And I wanna thank you, Peter, for giving me the chance to get everybody engaged. Thank you very much, Christine. We will definitely be in touch uh, with you and you'll, uh, members will learn a lot more about what's gonna be happening. So Ed Jellen, I skipped, I skipped you by one, but I'm coming back to you. How are you, Ed? Need to get you unmuted. I always forget that, don't I? There you go. Can you go hear me now? Uh, yes. Anyway, I'm uh, doing fine. Looking out there for visitors. Ah, let's see. I think uh, Brad Van Avery is uh, out there visiting us from uh, La Paz. So uh, welcome, Brad. And I think Donna, my Donna G, may be out there. Uh, Gene Ulis may be out there as well. Uh, yeah, there she is. So uh, those are our visitors uh, today, President Peter. All right, thank you very much, Ed, appreciate it. No visiting Rotarians, maybe next week. Maybe. All right, so thank you, uh, thank you very much, Ed. Jack, a couple more questions. Let's get you unmuted. There we go. All right, so same deal, we've got another one from the history book. What year was the ORE Oakland Rotary Endowment created? And then a bonus point to whoever can name the first contributor and at the time president. Holy smokes. I do see, uh, I do see Jack, that uh, looks like Ed Jellin won the Homer Wood answer. He did. Congrats to Ed. Fantastic. And we'll, so we'll come back to you at the end of the meeting. Uh, let's see, we got any, uh, any answers? Uh, not yet. We'll let those questions just sit for a few minutes. All right, so let's go on next. Dudley, next. President next. nominee next. Dudley Thompson. You're looking good in a very nice setting there, Dudley. What do you got to tell us? Need to get Dudley unmuted. There you go. Thank you, DeMaio. Uh, Carla Betts has, and Ken Betts, Carla this year has invited us to her backyard for a new member cocktail party. And since uh, we're having all these issues about attending uh, places, Carla, I'm going to be there, but Carla and I are going to broadcast from her backyard. And 
uh, all new members, uh, I think Pat has uh, sent you an email asking you to attend and uh, other members are invited, uh, committee chairs especially, who can share something about their committee. This will be on Thursday, May 7th. Uh, you'll have to bring your own um, to the party and you can enjoy it. We have a special, almost every year, there's been for about the last four or five years anyway, maybe more than that, because I think Tom Schmitz was the first one that challenged people to ring the bell. And if it, he got up to a thousand dollars, he would jump in the pool and swim with his clothes on. And so it's become the presidential plunge. And Sess has promised us he'll make a plunge. And I've even suggested that if the numbers get up high enough, Sess and I will race from one end to the other on the pool. So maybe two of us will jump in the pool this year. So join us uh, Thursday, May 7th in Carla's backyard or from your home to Carla's backyard, uh, 5.30 to seven o'clock. Thank you, Peter. Yeah, thank you. And I understand we're gonna do a little variation of the trivia that uh, our new members are giving us a little piece of information and we're gonna have a little contest to see uh, uh, who can match the piece of trivia with the individual, is that right? That's exactly right. We've asked new members to send in a one, fact about themselves and we're going to have a, a set up a little game with big prizes big prizes very very big prizes peter it's big genius prizes. You thought of that fantastic big prizes and beer man <laughs> margaritas how, how can it, margaritas can't be any better than that all right jack are you still around yes you are let me jack all right so uh, did we get an answer to that uh, ORE question? We're pretty close. Mary said uh, 1776. It was actually in 1707. <coughs> so I'll accept that, uh, you know, because Rotary Year, Rotary Presidents, they uh, straddle two years. But uh, she also guessed Bob. Bob is not the answer we're looking for. There you go. Mary's got it. All right. Fantastic. So let's do the last two questions and then I'm going to, we're going to move on to our speaker. All right. So which question number four, which Rotary Oakland president established the still ongoing brown bag lunch? All right. What was the other question? Or I'll do that question. So which current member and past president created the fake motto Live the four-way test and run like hell. <laughs> Come on, you guys should be able to get that one right off the bat. Jason, this one is that's <laughs> set up for you. <laughs> All right, and then the final, the final question of all, which Tom Lamont's probably going to get, is who did peeping Tom peep at? <laughs> all right. Jack, I'm leaving, I'm leaving it up to you to figure out the, the answers here and who wins, all right? So thanks a lot, Jack. We'll come back to you at the end. Sounds good. So before, before I go to Rini to introduce the speaker, I want to uh, go let you know that when we do our questions, we do it using the Q&A function. What you see on your screen now is an arrow pointing at the Q&A. There's a Q&A icon. The arrow points right at that little icon. You click on that icon, you're able to type in a question. We can see the questions and that's how we'll answer the speaker. Rini Raschke. Hi. Are you around? I am here. I'm up in Great. your upper left. Will you, introduce, will you introduce our speaker, please? With pleasure. Now on to the interesting part of our meeting. I have been <coughs> the longest time to get Damon on because he's always traveling. And when we almost had him last month, he was trapped in China. But now he's back. Damon a wonderful guy who I met when we were doing History of Lake Merritt. He's um, a biologist and a chemist and he's not afraid to use those skills. He's got an MFA in natural history and science filmmaking and he's going to show us some of the things that he has found in Lake Merritt since Major DD has cleaned it up. I'm very excited to have Damon here. Give it up. I want to see him. Let's mute me. All right, can you guys hear me and see me, or at least see my slide deck? Go ahead, Bob. We can hear and see you, Damon. Welcome. All right. 
Fantastic. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take you guys through, like Rini said, um, kind of a visual exploration of the organisms we've started to see after Measure DD. So this is actually a slide deck I put together for Audubon quite a few years ago because they were wondering, well, why do all these birds come to Lake Merritt? There's got to be the reasons, and it's most of it's beneath the surface. It's the critters they're eating. And we've really seen this kind of um, expand as that water quality's changed, and also just as we're getting more kind of tidal changes again, it's creating more niches for more organisms to live. Um, so this is usually a talk I give to like Laney and a couple other places that's about an hour long, and I'm going to condense that as much as possible into the 20 minutes. Um, so it'll be more of the visual portion of this and not the deep details in every organism. I'm actually going to skip the history because most of you guys kind of already probably have a decent history feel for Lake Merritt. You know, it's been around since the last ice age. People have been there for at least 4,000 years. Lots of people now live around it, which has been challenging for water quality. Um, and then, of course, I would say the two more contemporary things that are really big are Measure DD and the effects it's having on water quality at the lake. Um, and then also, a little further back, I think something always we need to recognize is Jim Carlton's work that started at Lake Merritt which was basically the foundation of an entire biological study known as the study of marine invasives. It was really Lake Merritt that we realized that organisms from different parts of the world and marine systems could end up in different places. Um, and Jim kind of tripped upon this as just being a super curious high school kid. Um, and he's continued on to be a world renowned researcher in the study of marine invasive species. Um, and a lot of this comes down to Oakland or Lake Merritt's um, location close to the port. So the majority of organisms we're gonna look at in this presentation are all non-vertebrates. And so I know when people get excited about going to Lake Merritt looking for organisms, they're usually thinking about big critters with backbones and can swim and things like that. And I figured, let's look at all the things people miss that are also extremely beautiful, um, but just are easy to miss. So. If we think about the food chain at Lake Merritt, a lot of it starts with you know, your primary producers. So there's of course tons of photosynthetic organisms at a single cell level in Lake Merritt, a whole host of diatoms, uh, cyanobacteria, all these other things. We have a huge catalog of this now in the platform called iNaturalist. If you're not familiar with this, this is probably the best citizen science tool out there for basically documenting species biogeography. And the guy that built the platform lives a couple blocks now from Lake Merritt, Kenichi Ueda, who works for the Cal Academy these days. Um, some of these plankton, for the most part, not too exciting to the average Joe walking around the lake, unless you happen to go around in September or October and throw some rocks in or push a boat around. And you'll notice that Lake Merritt actually has very strong bioluminescence events. So this is a photograph I took two years ago in a kayak uh, at the end of September. We're still trying to work out what species it is that causes this glow, but you'll end up with this really kind of deep blue glow, um, usually on the new moons in September and October. So probably a lignolium uh, species. We also have single cell organisms that eat all those other guys. There's a bunch of, a huge variety of rotifers that live in the lake, but really I think we're the most people can actually start seeing things and, and where most of the real visual exciting stuff is at the non-vertebrate level uh, starts with the tunicates that we have in Lake Merritt. So most of these guys are filter feeders and we have a variety of them um, from all over the world that live in Lake Merritt. In fact, in the corner of most of these slides, you'll see if it's native or non-native or where it came from. And once you'll quickly realize the majority of the organisms we're gonna look at are not originally from the west coast of the United States. They come from places Oakland is traded with. They come from the east coast because a lot of critters came in when people were um, starting to grow oysters in Lake Merritt at one point. And so Lake Merritt is very representative of actually the city of Oakland to some degree. You've got things that ended up here from all over the world and they're all working together in a balance that kind of still works every season. So the first one is this vase tunicate, Siona intestinalis, um, probably originally from Taiwan. These guys can get up to be about five to seven centimeters um, in height. And the reason I usually start off with this one for folks is I like to describe these as the thing most closely related to us in the lake that's not a fish. So these are chordates. At one point of their life, they look like a little mini tadpole. They basically swim around, they find a good place with food, they land down, they go through catastrophic metamorphosis where they become this basically a simple siphon system. Suck the water in, 
digest it, shoot it out the other pipe. Uh, these guys are also um, one of the core dates that was sequenced right after the Human Genome Project, which I worked on at the National Labs, because they were a really easy way for us to grow a core date and study them because you can see right through them. So you can do a lot of gene manipulation and see how that uh, dictated different pathways. We have a whole variety of tunicates though in Lake Merritt. This would probably be one of the few that is actually native to Lake Merritt or actually native to the West Coast. And this is the Pacific Solitary Sea Squirt. The reason these guys have this name, this common name of sea squirt, is if you were to take them out of the water and literally squeeze them, it's like a mini super soaker gun. They will just shoot a giant pulse of water out, pop them back in the water, they suck it all back up. You can start that whole process over again. So they're one of the entertaining ones for small kids to work with. We have also communal tunicates that live at Lake, Lake Merritt. So this chain tunicate here, instead of having two pipes, an in-pipe and an out-pipe, if you're gonna live together, it's bad to poop in your neighbor's face. And so in this case, they all use a communal tube to basically take their waste, throw it into one tube so it all goes out together. So each one of those little orange little dots you see there is an individual, and they're all clustered together in a large community. There's more intricate looking communities like these golden star tunicates um, that use a similar method. They all have um, one communal export tube, uh, but they're all individually filter feeding uh, food down. Right now is when we're starting to see these kind of come online in Lake Merritt. If you really wanna see the big diversity of Lake Merritt as far as marine species go, it's really the summer months because during the winter, you've got all this fresh water flooding down from the Oakland Hills which can kill a lot of the marine species. And so during the summer, we become much, much more like the bay water, a much higher um, salinity. And the same species though, due to environmental factors can basically color change. And so we can go from a golden color to this purple color due to trace minerals and also temperature differences within the water. Uh, we have sponges in Lake Merritt as well. Uh, these guys, for the most part, aren't big enough for you to go back to your bathtub and scrub up with. Uh, they're usually just a small encrusting sponge. You'll find them on mussels or just even on the walls of Lake Merritt. And if you get in really close to the microscope, you realize why sponges do all those things that people like to do, which is exfoliate their, your skin with them. You can see those little calcium carbonate crystals sticking out there that look like little sharp, dangerous things. To you though, they're so small that all they do is kind of brush off the cells of your um, outer skin. We also have a whole series of copepods in there. Um, and so you can think about these as kind of in the same lineage of other crustaceans like shrimp and crabs and things like that. Much smaller though, um, and mainly hunting all of the plankton in the lake. Um, if we scale up a bit in that same group of the arthropods, we have different types of shrimp in the lake. Um, this one is our one native um, skeleton shrimp, for obvious reasons it has that common name skeleton, it kind of looks like a bare boned organism. And what they do is they hold on to different surfaces with that kind of claw structure you see at the bottom of the frame there. And they literally have these kind of two big dew claws and they'll just bob around in the water and then catch things with that dew claw, bring it back uh, to that mouth and then eat it. Um, these guys can get up to be about two centimeters at the largest um, for this uh, Caprelia californica in Lake Merritt. These are easiest to see down where the channel is kind of coming into the lake. Um, we also have a whole bunch of these kind of gammered amphipods um, in Lake Merritt. Most notably, and actually I don't have a photograph of it in this slide deck, is we have one that is originally from Chile. Um, Jim Carlton saw it during his years there in the 60s and 70s and it still only incorporate or inhabits the same small beach area near the kind of you know monster sculpture uh, portion of Lake Merritt. It hasn't moved from there and it hasn't gone away. So it's got its little tiny home far, far away from its Chilean inhabitants back home, but it's making it. So we have a whole series of these type of gamma and amphipods. Um, a lot of these tend to be from Japan, Taiwan, and kind of Hong Kong areas. Uh, so Prantha japonica, obviously from Japan. These guys get to be a couple, almost like a, you know, four centimeters big. And it kind of looks like a shrimp got combined with a lobster. They've got these long lobster-like tails and then a small kind of like shrimpy uh, head to them. We also have isopods in the lake. Um, and you guys might be most familiar with these as things that are in your backyard, the roly polies, but isopods for the most part are a marine group. 
Uh, this specific one happens to be from Australia. Um, and this is the organism responsible for most of the wood damage in Lake Merritt and in the San Francisco Bay. These guys will drill through pieces of wood faster than just about anything you can imagine. In fact, if you find a piece of wood in Lake Merritt, you haul it out, you'll find all of these little tiny holes in it. And if you look into the back of those holes, there's usually spheromona in there going to town, eating all that wood. We also have other isopods that are parasitic in the lake. These guys actually will swim after fish, grab onto them, and then just slowly kind of bite and eat them. Um, some of the times I've been in the lake, um, just in my sandals, I've had them swim up to my leg and give my leg too close of a look for my liking, um, but nobody has grabbed on. Luckily, they're not you know, that big. It's like you know, just an oversized tick of the water, more or less, going after you. We also have traditional shrimp. So we have the oriental shrimp, uh, Palamon macrodilus in there. And this is one that people consume in Japan all the time. And so this one is easiest to see at the edge of Lake Merritt where you've got concrete meeting other pieces of concrete or rocks. They really like that habitat. And actually the easiest way to find them is if you go around Lake Merritt at night with a UV light, um, their exoskeleton does UV fluorescence in the same way that scorpion exoskeletons do. So that little bottom left corner there, you can see a little bright beam of light in the top hand corner and that's a shrimp um, fluorescing under UV light at night. We also have native arthropods in our lake. So we have the tuberculate pear crab, which pretty much nobody will see because they are masters of disguise. The only reason I ever see them is because I'm sitting looking at something else in the lake and all of a sudden the ground just gets up and walks away. Uh, and these guys can actually get to be relatively large compared to other organisms in Lake Merritt. So I'll occasionally find these, you know, up to like, you know, almost eight, nine inches across. Um, and these guys are our own native. They compete well with everybody else that's in there. And I would say they're one of our most exported invasives. So if you go to Japan or you go to Hong Kong and Taiwan, they're all, we got this one from you guys. Uh, we also have the yellow shore crab, um, another native uh, crab of the West Coast in there. This guy you'll primarily see when the tide is low um, and likes to hide out under rocks and basically pick up any sort of debris that's made its way down into Lake Merritt. We have a whole, whole slew of mollusks from all around the world. Uh, one of the most beautiful ones is the Asian date clam or the green bag mussel. And these guys are actually really amazing just at how quickly they will grow. These guys pretty much all die off after that salinity change in the winter. And by about midsummer, you'll have all of these, you know, three to four centimeter size shells all over the place. And they'll be growing right on top of sea lettuce um, and things like that that they're actually consuming. The outside of them is opalescent. And so if you hold it up in the light and you kind of go like this, you get that kind of pearling um, effect to it. They're really a gorgeous little tiny mollusk. We also have these huge, huge soft shell clams that are in Lake Merritt. So these probably came in with oyster beds from the East Coast. Um, and if you walk around Lake Merritt and you see shells kind of piled up all over the place, it's predominantly these. And so these are actually something that people would eat. I don't encourage you to eat them from Lake Merritt as they're filtering more stuff than normal. Um, especially things that they can aggregate. Um, the reason they're called a soft shell clam though is you can, if you pick them up, you can almost break your way through the, the shell just with um, a strong fist. We also have a whole series of mussels in the lake. And these are actually interesting because oh, since Jim Carlton's era to now, we've seen these population dynamics change due to changing salinity of the lake during drought seasons, et cetera. So we have the Atlantic rib mussel that we got from trading with um, the Mediterranean. Uh, these guys have these long kind of lateral lines on them that make them easier to um, speciate against our native stuff, which are these blue mussels. And actually we probably have two or three things that uh, macroscopically look to be similar to the blue mussel, which is an edible mussel that people would eat in places. Um, as salinity increases, we see more of these. And when we get rainy years, we'll see more of that Atlantic one because they can handle more of a brackish water system. So they're a really kind of easy indicator to tell what's been going on with salinity in the lake. Is if you go up towards the top of the lake where stuff is flowing in, do you see more of these or do you see more ones with ribs on them? Um, mollusks 
that hide their shells. We have Japanese bubble snails, which are just starting to hatch right now in Lake Merritt. This will pretty much go from something you don't see at all during the winter because they all die to if you hold still and look, you realize that they are just everywhere in Lake Merritt by the time June and August rolls around. So the reason they're called a bubble snail is they actually have a clear shell that they roll up inside of that looks like a little tiny kind of glass bubble. Um, but for the most part, it's really hard to see that shell because of the coloration of the tissue. And their tissue coloration blends them perfectly into the background of Lake Merritt. So really the easiest way to see them is look for a piece of trash on the bottom of Lake Merritt and then look for slime trails and then follow those slime trails and then you'll see these guys all over them. Um, one of my favorites in Lake Merritt, I don't get to see this enough, mainly because I think it would take a lot of time to see this enough because they're actually really hard to spot, is Hedgepath's sapsucker. Um, Hedgepath, if you're not aware, he was a famous marine biologist from Oakland, kind of an echinoclast. Um, and this organism pulls off some really wicked tricks. If you look at it, it kind of looks like a leaf. It's bright green, but it is a mollusk. It actually steals chloroplasts from the organism it eats and incorporates them into their cells. And so this is actually an animal that can kind of do photosynthesis. It can basically steal somebody else's food making machinery use that while it's continuing to eat other things. Um, and so it's a really, really cool organism. I've seen this, you know, probably about, I don't know, eight, nine times now at Lake Merritt. This tends to be closer to the inlet of Lake Merritt down by the Green Bridge is where I see it most frequently. We also get occasionally, it's been a couple of years, um, the California sea hare will come into Lake Merritt to lay eggs. So if you're looking at the lake and you think you see somebody dropped a cup of ramen in there, Take some time, make sure, is there any cup of ramen cups? No, okay. So now do I see any large slugs around? Because these cup of ramen looking things are usually the egg masses from these guys. And these can be relatively big. And then the slugs can get to be about the size of a rugby ball. Um, and they also have a really interesting defensive mechanisms to the way like octopuses do. So if you were to kind of like shake them up a whole bunch, they can actually kind of squirt out an ink all over the place. Um, and it's kind of amazing that these guys, you know, aren't more preyed upon, but the whole reason that is, and actually that last guy, why he's not preyed upon, and mainly actually this whole group we're going to talk about here, is they are able to eat things that are toxic and actually take either the stinging cells from the things they're eating or that poison and present it into their own tissue without damaging themselves so that nobody else eats them. Um, when we had our big year for sea hares, we had about 150 of these that came into Lake Merritt to basically lay eggs. Um, and then the numbers have kind of dwindled uh, since then. We think it was due to a warm water event. We also have a lot of these ones that traditionally common name people would say look like a nudibranch, these you know, sea slugs that are very decorated. So this is our sea lettuce eater. And you see all those little things coming up off of his back. Those are what we call Sarah. This is where it actually will take those toxins from the things that it's eating and present them so that nobody eats him because he's just a big, soft, fleshy piece of tissue, no shell, no anything. So you got to have some sort of defense and a chemical defense is pretty good with some warning colors like those bright yellow tips. Um, we also have a, a Placida dentrica there. This is one you traditionally would see in kind of bay waters. Uh, we've got Hedgepath, another Hedgepath uh, organism, Hedgepath dorid, which is one of the prettier ones just from color and kind of patterning go. These guys don't get very big, but they are very ubiquitous in Lake Merritt. You can find them everywhere from like the boat dock to the in lake or to the intake, almost to where water's coming in from uh, the hills. A couple years ago, actually, when Jim Carlton came back to do a survey, we found this the day before Jim came, but I couldn't find another one. And this is a nudibranch that you usually only find in the open Pacific side of our coastline. Like we rarely even see them in the San Francisco Bay. Um, we found three of them in Lake Merritt a couple of years ago. So I think for me, that was one of those times where I was like, oh yeah, water quality hasn't only changed a little bit. It has changed a lot that we're starting to see organisms like this be able to inhabit the lake. Uh, we also have a nudibranch that is named for Lake Merritt, and it's mainly because it was the first place it was ever seen was at Lake Merritt. The only bummer is we think it probably wasn't Lake from Lake Merritt. We think it's probably an invasive species from someplace else, just nobody has identified where that location is yet. 
Um, and this is one I personally have not seen. This is still on my bucket list. So this is a picture by Kenichi Ueda, the guy who started iNaturalist. We also have eastern mud snails in the lake. These guys are here all year round because they can handle, you know, big fluctuations in salinity. They could practically be in a freshwater stream for a couple days and then switch back over. These ended up here with the oyster beds. Um, and these will become very, very dominant in the winter because they've got no competition at that point. So you'll see them just congregating all over the bottom of Lake Merritt on those kind of clear and calm days in the water. We also have limpets in the lake, which are pretty cool. These guys do two types of breathing. So they've got um, what looks to be a really nice feather boa there, which is actually a gill. So they use that to breathe when they're underwater. And then you see the outside of their shell has all these little spikes on it. That mantle actually can do oxygen exchange when they're out of the water. So limpets have adapted to be out of the water for you know, an entire basically uh, tide change. So they could be out for five to seven hours easily. Um, we also have the Eastern oyster drill snail, which is the nemesis of every other mollusk in the lake, because these guys eat all of the other mollusks. So they actually have like a hard raspy device inside of their foot where they will crawl up on another mollusk and then just drill a hole into them spit juices in to digest them and then suck them back out. Um, and so these guys you find all over the Lake Merritt, they survived also that big change in uh, salinity as well. Um, and they are actually a really kind of cool looking shell. And it's actually one of the easier ones for a lot of people to find when they go to the lake. And then you tell them the backstory and they're like, whoa, that's amazing. This is what their eggs look like. Their eggs are actually even really cool too. And they're usually, if you're flipping over rocks, you'll find these egg packages um, underneath the rocks. They also UV fluoresce really brightly, so they're easy to find at night. We have Pacific shipworms in here. And so these are native. This is the whole reason, well, not the Pacific ones, but shipworms are the whole reason. Christopher Columbus's like third voyage to the Americas took a lot longer than he was expecting because his entire boat got eaten out by these. And so these are a mollusk, even though the common name is worm on them. So they use their shell to actually grind wood, and then they use enzymes from bacteria in their gills to digest the wood and then bring that back into the GI tract to then get the nutrients out. So this is something I actually used to work on when I worked at the national labs, because if you're looking for good cellulases that operate at cold temperatures, this is a fantastic organism for that. We have flatworms in the lake as well. Um, these guys, actually, this is probably not the right species name, so don't take that for, you know, for what it is. Uh, this probably actually needs DNA work done on it. We have a lot of nadarians in the lake, so that means things like sea anemones and stuff like that. Okay, I've flipped through these relatively quick. We do get uh, jellyfish in the lake. These are ones I just found this year. And these guys are really cool because as light hits them, like rainbows basically flow up and down them. We get lots of um, different types of annelids and uh, a, a polychaetes in the lake. And so these are segmented worms that eat everybody else in the lake. Actually, one of these we're working on right now, it's probably a new species. I'm working with LA County Natural History Museum on it. Um, and there's just a huge, huge variety there um, in the lake. This is the organism that really keyed Jim Carlton off to the fact that marine species could get from one place to another and this is, uh, I wish there was a decent common name for it. So I'm just gonna go ahead and butcher the Latin, Ficomopodus enigmatus. And so this is a polychaete worm that makes these huge calcite kind of tubes to live in. And Jim had found this and couldn't get anybody at UC Berkeley to identify it and then happened to see it in a magazine about Australia. So sent it down there when he was in high school. And of course they write him back, dear doctor, da da da. And Jim's like 17, 16 at the time. And he's like, well, I'm not a doctor, but I just found this thing. And, and this kind of kicked off that entire start of the marine invasive um, discipline for marine biology. We also have things that are closely related, more closely related to like corals in the lake, these bryozoans. And so these are uh, colony forming organisms that will usually make some sort of calcite structure that they live in. So each one of those little holes there you see is an individual organism. These guys produce some pretty nasty toxins if you're a small organism. We get ones that actually look more like a coral, they kind of branch, but these are soft. And then, of course, we get into the larger stuff. I'll do a couple of these really quick. We have bay pipefish in there, tons of yellowfin gobies from Australia. And then the one that everybody loves is we have those California bat rays that will be all over the lake, usually towards the end of the summer. There's a whole heck of a lot of other stuff at Lake Merritt, but we don't have time for that. And so I'll just kind of leave it there for you guys. Damon.
Thank you very much. Who knew? Who knew there were so many critters rolling around inside that lake? Um, we do. We do have some uh, questions for you. Yep. Uh, so first question: Does Damon dive in the lake to find these specimens? Water looks so icky. How do you see anything? So the majority of these are found by just actually walking the edge of the lake um, and looking for organisms where you find substrate. So if you find a rock or you find like, if you go to the boat dock and you put your hand underneath the boat dock and pull stuff up, I mean, you'll pull about 20 species with one handful. Um, and so those are my kind of go-to places are rocks in the lake and then underneath the docks. I do snorkel in the lake occasionally, but I would not suggest or encourage anyone to do that on a regular basis. All right. So thanks, Damon, for taking time to share these great pics. Uh, curious if you work at Lawrence Berkeley Lab and how you're conducting research or working during shelter in place. So I used to work for Lawrence Berkeley and Lawrence Livermore. I worked on the Human Genome Project, but I currently actually work for BioRad Laboratories, which is one of the companies making the diagnostic uh, materials for COVID. But I'm mainly involved in teacher education at this point through BioRad, and so I am spending the majority of my life in these meetings. <laughs> mainly Zoom meetings with teachers online, helping them adapt to how to do teaching online with students. Fantastic. And uh, then this questioner also wants us to remind folks to pound, give Lake Merritt a break during COVID. <laughs> Stay safe, save visits for a bit longer. So Stephanie Casenza is asked, uh, which, which of these animals are dangerous to dogs and humans? None of the ones I showed you in this slide deck are dangerous to dogs or humans. Uh, none of them are producing toxins at a level that would be dangerous to um, anything our size or dog size. Dangerous if you're, you know, a couple cells across, but, you know, once you're at our level, no danger. Lorna Pediamarcus says, I'll never look at the lake the same. Who knew there was so much in it? And how big do pear crabs get? Um, pear crabs, I mean, they'll get to be, you know, eight, nine inches across. Um, I mean, the majority of ones I'm seeing in Lake Merritt are more like maybe about the size of my hand. Um, but they can, I've seen some really, really large specimens in the lake. All right, and then there's an anonymous attendee who wants to know whether the video of this session will be shown at the Rotary Nature Center, and uh, I can't answer that question. All right, that is the end of the question. So, Damon, I wanted to thank you very, very much for uh, coming and presenting to us today. And it's a tradition of our club uh, to, to make a donation to the End Polio Now program. Since 1987, the Rotary uh, International and Rotary clubs around the world have been in the process of trying to eradicate polio from the face of the earth. And we are this I know. close. And so in your honor, we are making a donation to End Polio Now. And uh, we want to thank you very much and hope that you feel good about that uh, little, uh, little donation we're making. I feel so great thank about you it. Thank very much, Damon. Okay. Uh, next week. Uh, so I have the honor of doing the teaser for next week. Next week, we have a very special uh, presentation. We, are, we have uh, organized with the five clubs who were first chartered within the Rotary organization. That is Chicago, San Francisco, us at Oakland is number three, Seattle is number four, and Los Angeles is number five. All five of those presidents, presidents have gotten together and we have organized a meeting on Thursday, May the 7th. It will be at 11 a.m. because the Chicago club is two hours after us and they, so we compromised a bit. We're gonna start early. They're gonna start a little bit later than usual. And we have the honor of Rotary International President Mark Maloney as our featured speaker. Uh, this meeting will contain three breakout sessions, one on local community service, 
Uh, and David Kittner, I know, is planning on attending, and I'm hoping other community service people will plan on attending. Also, a breakout session on international community service, and Renia Webb is one of the organizers of that session. And finally, there will be a session on membership. And the idea is for all of these five clubs to begin to cooperate a little more closely, and maybe we can do more impactful or larger projects. You do need to register in advance. If you go to the club calendar, you will see that meeting on the calendar. The registration link is there. We will also, of course, be emailing this registration link. You must register in advance uh, for this meeting. Uh, it, it, the attendance is unlimited. I know at this point there's over 100 uh, Rotarians from the five clubs that will be attending. We will also be uh, putting this up on YouTube, not live, but after the meeting's been done, it'll be posted uh, on YouTube. So uh, please plan on attending. All right, Jack. Hey, Jack Peter. Isles, there you are. So, uh, so I understand you got some stuff you need to pass on to us. Yeah, yeah, that, uh, that, that, Live Zoom chat sounds exciting. I'll be sure to register for that. But I want to let everyone know that over on our YouTube stream, Isaac, uh, Isaac Cost Red rang the bell. So thank you, Isaac. Fantastic. So I'd better ring the bell then, huh? All right. Thank you, Isaac. It doesn't quite have the same ring as the real bell. But it's better okay. than nothing. And then for the trivia, Mary is yeah. our winner. She got uh, three questions right, two questions, and the bonus question, or the bonus point. So, Mary, you'll get your hat pretty soon here. Oh, fantastic. You can pick it up any time. So, uh, did anybody come up with the right answer to that question about uh, uh, follow the four-way test and run like hell? That was, uh, let's see. So, the, the president That was, was Stephanie. Stephanie, good job, Stephanie. And the president was Jack McAvoy. <laughs> All right. So thank you very much. Um, what time is the meeting next week, Jack? The meeting's at 11. Right. And do people have to register? You've got to register in advance, check your email, or go on the calendar. You do have to register. That's for sure. All right. So um, uh, thank you, Jack. For, for your work on this. Uh, thank you very much, Damon. We, I really enjoyed that talk, and for some reason yeah, I was you, able to Damon. concentrate on it today. Thank you to all of those who participated. The Rotary Club of Oakland plays an incredibly important uh, philanthropic role within uh, Oakland. The Cerrone Lena Scholarships and the work that we've done with Oakland Promise are uh, to help support early childhood education are a very important part of what we do. And so Mia, if you're still with us, maybe not. Mia, we're welcome. We're, we really want to welcome you to membership within the club. And um, remember that the Rotary Club of Oakland unites people to create lasting change in our communities and around the world. And with that, this meeting is adjourned.